I'm Meg West from Garden Wise, the quarterly sustainable landscaping program. This time we're going to focus on organics. Now organic gardening is much more than just not using synthetic pesticides and herbicides. In order for an organic garden to be successful, you have to focus on soil fertility, having the right plant in the right place, cleaning up the garden at the right time of the year, observing what's going on in your garden with all the pests and diseases that might crop up, and getting in there and controlling them at the right time with organic ways. So we're going to talk to a lot of different professionals this time about how they use organics either at a nursery or to maintain landscapes or all these different sorts of things where organics are being applied and help you learn how to do it in your own backyard. For my first stop, I headed to Healing Grounds Nursery to learn all about organic gardening. I'm here today with Oscar Carmona from Healing Grounds Nursery. He's been growing plants and involved with things like that for most of his life. Hi, Oscar. Mm, hello. Thanks for, thanks for uh, having us here today. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you guys over. So I kind of wanted to start out with the big kahuna. Why is it important for people to garden organically? Well, I think fundamentally, uh, a good place to start in this discussion is at the dinner table. And I think um, you can't get any better in terms of taste and flavor than going out into your garden and picking that fruit uh, or vegetable, mm -hmm. uh, as the case may be, and taking it right into your kitchen and eating it. Uh, in terms of nutrition, you can't get any better than that. The, the closer something is from being picked to actual eating it, the, the more content nutritionally you're gonna get. Mm -hmm. um, backtracking, from there, uh, soil fertility is the key. And um, that means lots of organic matter in the form of compost and mulch. And um, that addresses other issues as well. I think what the, the thing about conventional uh, gardening is it doesn't, first of all, fundamentally does not acknowledge that it's necessary to have a vital, vibrant soil system. And that's a fundamental distinction. And in, as such, commercial fertilizers, they're pr primarily salt-based. Mm -hmm. And so while they offer nitrogen or uh, phosphorus or potassium in, in, very, uh, in very significant amounts, certainly higher than an organic fertilizer or you know, of any sort, but, but they, it does so at the expense of the living, of the life forms in the soil. So if you're using a synthetic uh, chemical fertilizer on your soil, the high salt buildup would make it impossible for, say, earthworms to live in the earthworms, soil? Earthworms, and that's... Microorganisms, all the good guys that you want, and right. good and bad and ugly. I mean, everybody out, out the door. In, in a very uh, fertile, rich soil, the good guys far outnumber the bad guys. Mm -hmm and they keep them in check naturally. Right. And so, but it's the soil web where everything's yeah. kind of, it's, it's basically Dynamic. the, so the organic type of soil is the way that nature has kept the, the earth stable for right. thousands and thousands, right. hundreds of thousands of years. Yes. And we're just helping nature strengthen that cycle. Yeah, and, and, the, and, and the commercial uh, system, which is world and global uh, oriented. In other words, plants are grown and produced not for flavor, mm -hmm. not for nutrition, mm -hmm. but for shippability right. and storageability. And so when, you, when you're growing at home, you are getting the very things that you're not getting in the stores. So if people are wanting to start to get into more organics and transition from a more traditional way of taking care of their yard, they may or may not have food crops. If they want to make that jump into being more organic, what's a great first step for someone to take? Well, the first step is to start recycling your green waste, mm -hmm. I think, because there's this other added problem that we have here, there, or just about any municipality, which is uh, storage space in the landfill. Right. And the fact that we throw out way too much stuff. But add to that the fact that we have something that we're throwing away, which is the, the, the gold right. of, of, of rich soil. You know, it's this what becomes compost. Mm -hmm. It's organic matter. And so if people can start to uh, begin to recycle this, and you can do it outside in a static pile or you can do it in a worm bin, mm -hmm. um, there, there are many ways to be able to get that food to, to compost, to break down, and then get that in your garden. 
So this is a interior view of my worm bin. It's just basically some slats on end, four by eight, and I've added all these green this green waste from, as I mentioned, uh, the Galita Coffee Company. It's mm -hmm. a lot of coffee grounds and juice pulp. It and, smells like coffee. And some of their breakfast fixings. And I also uh, uh, recycle my newspapers in here and cardboard. And then I mix in a little straw to keep it. I don't even have a lid on here, wow. but I keep it moist. And you can see that a worm bin, one of the key things is it likes moist. They don't immediately eat the food that you put into a bin. It has to decompose gotcha. to a certain rate. And then they're going to start to, you know, further decompose it. So you want to keep them under a nice layer of yeah. organic matter like that, right? Yeah. So that they don't like the sunlight. They don't like right. the heat. They like to be protected in here. Yeah. And looks like a pile of straw, but underneath they're making soil. So once your worms have done their job and made these worm castings, what do you do with it? Well, basically what I tell people is that when it looks like dirt, which is this, no longer, you can no longer recognize what it is that you put in there, then it's pretty much composted. It means it's broken down and ready to go. The nutrients are available. So this can be added to your garden in, uh, or in and around the plants on top or before you plant down into the root zone. Um, it's a wonderful addition to, especially for uh, container gardens. Mm -hmm. um, and to, I add it to, even if I buy the potting soil, I add, always add my own compost. It's just wonderful. One of the things I do with my business is uh, consult with individuals and businesses and groups, organizations that are interested in uh, increasing their capacity to grow food for themselves. I'm passionate about getting people to grow food and it's just not about getting people the plants, it's about giving people information. Some of the work I'm doing with has to do with encouraging people with low income to grow food. And the thing that, that's really wonderful about that is that there's so many opportunities for resources that are, that are naturally around us. Uh, and this being one of them, this is a five gallon bucket. It's a paint bucket. You know, everybody has one of these or can get these pretty easily. The, the great thing about a five gallon bucket is the capacity for a five gallon bucket is, is, is really a good, it's a good size for the root keeping roots for tomato plants. In this case, we have cucumbers, and you can see they're doing really well. Okay, let's review what we've learned. The most important thing for organic gardening is to improve your soil fertility. Now you can do that by avoiding using synthetic fertilizers, recycling your green waste in a compost bin, or creating a worm bin. Now in the worm bin, you're collecting those valuable worm castings. When they look like dirt, they're ready to use. So you can take your worm castings or your compost, apply them to your plants and trees, and use it to grow your own food. After talking to Oscar about how easy it is to garden organically, I went to check out what organic products a local garden supply store had to offer. Here we are at Island Seed and Feed, one of my favorite stores in the whole world. Where better to go to learn about organic pest control and fertilization than a store that specializes exclusively in organic gardening? So I gotta warn you, I'm a little bit like Katy Perry in a wig store here. It's hard to get me out of this place, so you've been warned. Let's go. Before we look at some actual products, how do we know if something is organic? Well, the stamp of approval for organic products is this, the OMRI stamp. OMRI stands for Organic Materials Review Institute, and its job is to verify that a product is indeed organic. OMRI reviews and approves material inputs to organic agriculture to determine whether they are allowed under the U.S. organic rules. If they are, then the OMRI seal lets organic farmers and gardeners know that a particular product is safe to use in an organic garden. So here we are in the organic fertilizer section at, or at Island Seed and Feed. As you can see, there's lots of different products. I just wanted to show you a few that I really like. Up here on top is the Malibu Compost Biodynamic Compost Tea, and this is made in the Central Valley, and it's great for making compost tea to spray on your plants. This is something you can make by yourself also at home, but if you want the more, the more instant product, this is a great way to go. Helps to control diseases on plants and just makes your plants really strong in general. Uh, another product that's highly recommended is anything with kelp in it. Here's one called Kelp Green. And uh, if you don't want to buy it, you can go to the ocean and collect some kelp and put it in your compost pile. That works too. But again, if you want the quick and, quick and easy method, comes in a liquid form that can be either applied straight to the leaves of your plant or used as a fertilizer in the soil. Um, we also have a lot of products that are made with worm castings. 
Here's one that's made pretty close to home in the San Inez Valley. Comes in these big bags. And uh, worm castings are so great because they increase the biological activity in your soil. All those little microbes and fungi and everything that makes healthy soil is really increased by a lot of worms in your soil. And that worm casting just takes it to the next level. Again, that's something you can make at home with a worm bin. But if you want to buy it here, they've got it. You can also fight your pests organically in the garden. Here's a couple things that'll help. Tangle foot, an organic barrier you can put around the trees and it prevents ants from crawling up into the canopy. Uh, totally safe, good way to fight ants in your fruit trees. What else do we got here? Oh, copper tape barrier. Um, the slugs won't cross copper, so this could be a barrier around a vegetable garden or around a tree where you're having a snail and slug problem. So what do you do to kill the aphids that are sucking the blood out of your cabbage plants and do it organically? Well, you can buy a product like this that's uh, got organic stuff in it like beeswax and citric acid, mustard powder. There's lots of stuff that'll kill those soft bodies, bodied insects. Or if you want to make something at home, a little bit of Dr. Bronner's soap, some cayenne pepper and Tabasco, spray it on those aphids, they're gone. Here's the bulk bins at Island Seed and Feed. Pretty cool place to shop because you can mix and match your own soil amendments and your own fertilizers. You can bring your own, your own bag and cut down on the packaging. Pretty great. But it's a little overwhelming when you look at this whole list of things and how do you know what to get? The first thing you need to know is what these three numbers mean. Uh, these are the three major plant nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And each one of these organic soil amendments and fertilizers has a different balance. How do you know what your specific soil needs? Well, chances are you probably don't, so you gotta get it tested. You can take a soil sample, send it in, and if you specify that you're looking for organic amendments, they'll tell you exactly what you should add, and then you can come to a place like this and make your own special amendment mix that'll increase the biological activity of the soil. Here are a few labs where you can send your soil for testing. Now, when you're doing organics, that biological activity is so important because that increases the water holding capacity of your soil and makes the plants a lot healthier. When you have organic matter and healthy soil, lots of worms and fungus and, and bacteria moving around in their little soil web, then that's what creates the healthy, healthy balance in the soil that results in healthy plants. Now that we know how to maintain a garden organically, I wanted to talk to someone about organic landscaping on a commercial scale. So I'm here today with Sarah Kitson of Kitson Landscape Management, and she's going to tell us a little bit about organic uh, garden care from a commercial perspective. She runs a company that specializes in uh, taking care of commercial landscapes, and she was actually one of the pioneers here in Goleta and all of Santa Barbara County in doing organic maintenance on a commercial scale. So, great to have you, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks for having us out here today. Um, so how long have you been taking care of this place? Um, we're here at the Yardy building in Goleta. We've been maintaining this property for about six years or so. Um, when we came on board here, they had shifted from a traditional landscape care program um, to our company, and then the owner came and said, hey, is there any way we could switch to organic here? I said, sure, <laughs> we can figure that out for you. Um, I sort of grew up with organic gardening at home in the backyard, veggie garden, side by side with my mom. But on a commercial scale, it's much different. You just can't right. make a pile of your manure over here and start composting over here where you have to contend with people working here. Yeah. And they don't want to smell the smells. That's right. And <laughs> yeah, you can't use um, fish emulsion no. when people are working right next to it. It smells and pretty nasty. When we first started, there weren't a lot of products on the market that we could use on this scale. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the fertilizers that were organic were either too fine where they wouldn't go through our fertilizer spreaders well or they had a strong odor. So over the years we just we tried different products that were organic and over the last couple years we found better ones now that people don't even realize we're putting out an organic fertilizer anymore because it doesn't smell. So one of the challenges on a commercial level is making sure your garden looks good all the time. People at coming to work, clients coming to an important meeting, don't expect to come in and see a big pile of compost next to the front door or the plants all cut back. So it's a balance between keeping your 
landscape healthy and organic and also making it look good all the time. So I'd say that's probably one of our biggest challenges on a commercial scale property. So I want to talk about one pest problem we have here on Hemerocallis daylilies. Um, rust is a big problem for us on daylilies. You can see here it's a fungus. And there isn't a great horticultural option that's uh, organic. So one of the methods we use on this is mechanical. Like this plant here, you're starting to get more and more leaves showing the rust, and they'll start turning sort of a yellow, dusty look. And at a certain point, you have to decide, okay, this plant doesn't look good anymore. I'm not gonna leave this sitting here for everyone to see. So what we'll do is we'll go in and we'll cut that plant back really hard. So we'll take a plant and basically cut it all the way back to the base. And we'll remove all this material off site and we'll take it and we'll recycle it, but we won't leave it here. So we'll wanna clean up and do a really good job of cleaning up because we don't wanna leave that pest here to reinfect the new growth. And then in about a week or two, the daily starts coming back really fresh and nice. And you can see here, these have been cut back for about a week to two weeks, maybe a little bit less. And then within a month, they look full and nice and fresh again and are reflowering. We're standing under a very sad looking oak tree here. And if you're a homeowner with an oak in your yard, you know what I'm talking about. There are oak moths in Santa Barbara County that will just completely infest a tree and completely defoliate it within you know, a couple days. These things work fast. So you gotta get on it quick when they're caterpillars. And Sarah treated this tree, so I'll let her, her tell you about how to deal with it organically. Timing is critical when you're dealing with insects, populations, especially ones that can explode in such quantities as the oak moth caterpillar. Um, usually we get our first indications of oak moth when people call and go, hey, there's all these moths fluttering around my house and in my yard and I'm not around my oak tree, what should I do? Well, I usually tell people don't worry about oak moths, worry about what's coming next. The caterpillars, the hungry caterpillars are the ones that do this damage to the oak trees by eating all of the leaves off and the new growth. So on this particular property, um, we had let the client know that there were some oak moths in the area and we started seeing populations of the caterpillars and gave them the option to treat the trees organically. There, is, there are several options on the market to treat oak moth caterpillars organically. Um, BT is a common one found um, at OSH and places like that that homeowners can utilize the products. This we were allowed to treat a little bit too late, but there will be some residual activities. You can see all the new growth here. The new leaves are not being eaten by the caterpillar. So this tree will leaf out completely and look great within a few weeks. The one behind us there, that one has already leafed out and is great, doing well. Um, we were just trying to find some caterpillars here and actually didn't find any in the tree, but looking on the ground, we found a couple that are dead, <laughs> which is what we wanted. <laughs> um, you can also see all this fine powder here this is actually the caterpillar's frass, which is what they drop after they eat the leaves. So oh, this wow. is um, great fertilizer now. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> so we can just spread that out in the plants. Nice, so if you've got the oak moth in your yard, don't spray toxic synthetic chemicals all over it. Use something organic, it works just as well. It's a lot better for the environment and for your plants. So Sarah, I'm curious, if you had to recommend one organic garden care method that would be the most important, what would it be? That's easy, mulch. Mulch is critical to any landscape, whether organic or not. Uh, mulch keeps weed growth down, so you're minimizing the amount of hours you have to spend hand pulling weeds. Mm -hmm. It also keeps the moisture in the soil, so it's important you do a nice thick layer, two to three inches ideal. Make sure you don't pile it up against the tree trunks or building walls or anything like that. But a nice thick layer also helps keep the drip lines covered if you're on drip irrigation, keep them from breaking down with the sun. Um, mulch also just as it, over time it breaks down and becomes soil and improves your biodynamics of all your soil. So uh, here's the mulch you use here. Where'd you get this stuff? Um, this is recycled green waste material. Um, all of this comes off of job sites just like this. So we're not buying in quantities of redwood forest material or anything like that right. from far away. We're actually taking plant material trimmings, taking that, recycling it, composting it, and putting it right back out. Um, the expense of this material, a lot of it goes into the labor of making it and also just applying it. It takes a lot of man hours to physically go in on a scale of, you know, a commercial site this big to put, to actually apply the mulch. And this is something you want to do at least once a year, if not twice a year, depending on your site. 
Good, so there's lots of um, sources for this recycled mulch in town. Here are some local sources for recycled mulch. This mulch is made from chipped tree trimmings, so the quality can vary. I loved hearing all the ways Kitson Landscaping has incorporated organics into the maintenance of their properties. Next, I wanted to look into how to maintain a lawn organically. I'm on my way to see Nico Libero of Rincon Landscapes to talk about a property that he has maintained organically for the past seven years. Here we're showing how we always wash the machine before getting to another uh, yard. This is important uh, just to not carry any weeds or disease to another place. An easy way to fertilize your lawn organically is to leave grass clippings on the lawn. Just take the bag off the mower and let the clippings, which are very high in nitrogen, act as a natural fertilizer. It's free and easy and totally organic. Another benefit of adding organic matter to your soil is this. Organic matter improves the water holding capacity of your soil. Gardens with healthy soil are more drought resistant and need less irrigation overall. In addition to the water savings produced by gardening organically, Nico's clients decrease water usage through careful monitoring and adjustment of their irrigation clock. This is a traditional um, property in Montecito, Santa Barbara. And uh, yes, there's a lot of water usage uh, in this area. Now these uh, people particularly went for uh, transforming all their sprinkler systems in their landscape plants to drip in order to save water. And they kept the sprinklers just for the, for the lawn. So although they have a lawn, they are doing their best to keep the water budget tight. It's as easy as coming and turning it off when it rains or just to adjust percentages. And that way you are sure you're doing the best usage of the water. So anyone who's watched Garden Wise in the past knows that we definitely don't promote lawns because lawns are thirsty, they take a ton of water, they're expensive to maintain, and they're usually maintained with synthetic fertilizers and chemicals that are bad for the soil and bad for the environment. But some people just absolutely have to have their lawns, I understand. So if you're gonna have a lawn, maintain it organically. As you can see, there are lots of ways to apply organic gardening principles at home, such as caring for your lawn, growing your own food, and dealing with plant pests and diseases organically. Now gardening organically is easy and it's the right thing to do to protect the environment. So next time you're at the garden store, take a look for that OMRI label. We'll be right back. Every day water is wasted. Help conserve water by following these tips. Don't leave the hose running. A typical hose delivers nine gallons of water per minute. That's almost 600 gallons wasted in an hour. Water your grass at night to prevent water from being evaporated. Take shorter showers. Reducing shower time by just four minutes could save 4,000 gallons of water per year. Turn off the faucet when you're brushing your teeth. Save the environment and your wallet. For more tips on water conservation, check out svwater.org. Hey, how would you like to get paid to install sustainable landscaping? Drip irrigation, mulch, ow, and um, drought tolerant plants. It sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? Well, it actually it is true. Here's what you do. Go to sbwater.org or check with your local water purveyor to find out about Santa Barbara County's Smart Landscape Rebate Program. Free money to do landscaping. I mean, how cool is that? Welcome back. You might remember last episode, we introduced a new segment called What Tree Is That? So in each episode, we'll pick an interesting tree and tell you all about it. This time we've chosen a remarkable tree, the Brazilian cedar wood. What tree is that? What tree is that? Ah, what tree is that? What tree is that? Hi, I'm Randy Baldwin, General Manager of San Marcos Growers. And uh, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about one of my favorite trees, the Brazilian cedarwood tree. The 
trees we have in Santa Barbara, such as this one right here, beautiful Cedrella Fissilis. Um, we have thanks to the devotion uh, to trees and uh, arboriculture of many nurseries and uh, horticulturists in the Santa Barbara area. This tree right here was uh, brought in to the nursery trade by uh, Dr. Franceschi. Uh, in 1905, he brought this tree in. And we all know of Dr. Franceschi as being someone that uh, had a nursery and garden and home up on the Riviera, which is now a city park. But he also had a nursery here down by Gutierrez and State Street that is uh, near where we are here and where the first tree of this type was planted in 1905. The trees that we're looking at here are all trees that were planted from seed off of that tree. These were all planted in 1911, so they're over 100 years old. Uh, they were planted by the parks director, Dr. Doremus. He planted the street trees from Chapala down to Santa Barbara, and these trees have all been uh, great trees along here. They're very high-headed, so they don't get knocked down by trucks. They are not lifting the pavement. They are uh, beautiful bark. Uh, the stunning kind of foliage that they have, dramatic foliage. They don't have a dramatic flower, big flower, but they have a nice white flower in May and June, and they're followed by a very nice woody capsule uh, seed that's useful in uh, crafts and uh, just it's actually very attractive. Uh, the foliage is very nice and flushes when it first comes out. Uh, in the uh, January, February in a very bright pink. It is a deciduous tree. This tree has no foliage in the middle of winter. Uh, in its uh, native habitat, which is uh, from Costa Rica down to Argentina, it is an evergreen tree, but here it's uh, more of a deciduous tree. And it's considered to be one of the uh, cedar woods, uh, which is a mahogany. There's a few other trees in town that are related to it, but these are, these are really in the mahogany family and this is a great representative of it. There's a couple of really good books about this tree, uh, including The Trees of Santa Barbara, written by Robert Muller and photographs by J.R. Haller. Uh, good photos of the tree, talks about how it's used. Another tree that's a book that's really useful is The Street Trees of Southern California. It highly recommends this uh, tree. One of the things about this tree that's, uh, that's good is it's, it's tolerant of a lot of conditions. Uh, when you uh, plant this tree, you'd want to irrigate it regularly and get some fast growth out of it. But in the long run, it becomes a very drought tolerant tree. As you can see, these tree wells are not regularly irrigated. The tree is a very tough uh, drought resistant tree. Uh, it, one, had, one drawback about it in Santa Barbara is you wouldn't want to put it too close to the coast because it's noted that the, um, the direct coastal winds can tatter it. But we're, we're about four blocks off the coast here right here on Gutierrez Street, and it's done very, very well. So it's good, good there. And there's trees scattered around town that have performed very well also. Other than that, there really are no pests on this, for this tree. It's a, it's a pest-free tree, another reason why arborists really like this tree. You don't have to root prune it. You can see that you know, these 100-year-old trees are not lifting pavement, which is amazing. Uh, the Southern California uh, Tree Advisory Committee recommends this tree for street tree plantings and uh, once they know that it is more widely available, I'm sure there certain other municipalities will start planting it because uh, it is a, it's a great, beautiful tree. If you're interested in learning more about the Brazilian cedarwood, go to www.smgrowers.com. In 2006, the Garden Wise Guys renovated Santa Barbara's Firescape Demonstration Garden. Now, in 2012, the garden's gone through some renovation, and up next, we'll talk to two local landscape designers who worked on the project. In 1979, Santa Barbara's Firescape Demonstration Garden was first installed. The idea for the garden was developed after the 1977 Sycamore Canyon fire by the original Garden Wise Guys hosts and landscape architects Owen Dell and Billy Goodnick. At this garden, you can get ideas on water-wise plants, landscape design, and what to plant in the high fire hazard areas of Santa Barbara County. Located across the street from Fire Station 7 on Stanwood Drive, this 1.7-acre demonstration site shows how wildfire can be reduced through appropriate planting of water-wise plants, irrigation, and management using a zone system. There are four zones. Zone 1 
is the closest to the house with low plants that are fire resistant, and zone four is furthest from the house with taller plants and trees that can fade into the native landscape. At the beginning of this year, zone one of the garden underwent renovation. Two local landscape designers, Ariana Janzma and Jennifer Voss, volunteered their time to update the garden with some of the latest and greatest succulents now available. Uh, both Jennifer and I are, are thrilled to be participating in this project. We feel that um, the original designers, uh, Owen Dell and uh, Billy Goodnick, have all been um, fabulous in getting this created from the beginning. This is Euphorbia Tasmanian Tiger. The Euphorbias all have milky sap. The milky sap is present also in the roots, so it discourages the gophers. They do not eat these plants. They tend to stay away from them. So you can use the euphorbias as a plant to give you a little bit of protection, hopefully, from the gophers. And there are some euphorbias that will get bigger and give you more protection because their roots are very big. Um, but this one, again, is another one of those variegated plants really glows when the light hits it. And when these flower, the flowers are just amazing. They truly look like they're lit from inside. Um, this one gets about um, maybe two by two, something like that. And when the flower stalk is done, you just cut it to the ground and um, the next year you'll get some new ones, but the plant stays there. So they're a tough little plant and uh, none of these like lots of water. Um, everything does really well with very low water and good drainage. After Zone 1 was updated, we went back with landscape designer Jennifer Voss to see how the garden looked three months later. We want to um, talk a little about, about Zone 1 being the closest to the house and the one that you would want to plant, the, the lower plantings, uh, the fleshier plants, the plants with more moisture, the more succulents, and in this case we've done that, mixed it a little bit with the um, New Zealand flax and the Cape Rush. The great thing about these sedums is that uh, when they, if there's enough moisture, if, uh, if they break off or if they're knocked off, they'll just reseed themselves. So eventually this will be, again, this beautiful bed, this beautiful lime green uh, surrounded by these beautiful gray, this is a, a, a relative, this is um, blue spruce, sedum blue spruce, with these wonderful flowers that match the uh, contrast of sedum angelina. It's just, a, it's a wonderful, it, it's a wonderful plant for close to the house. This particular uh, plant is one of our favorites. It, it'll spread out and fill this entire area and um, it's a really easy to maintain plant. Uh, it doesn't have, uh, has low water requirements, very fleshy leaves. These are aeoniums. There are dozens and dozens of different aeoniums. This is Aeonium carol. This here is a euphorbia. It's a little difficult to see now, but later on, once it matures, it'll fill this area in. I think these plants really set off the native boulders that we have here in Santa Barbara. And um, the gravel pathway is done with a um, Palm Springs pea gravel. And the planter bed is done with um, California gold, which is very, very available. Eventually this should fill in and be one full mass of greenery. We've got aloes in here and yuccas and sedums and it's just a really, I think, a really interesting, um, uh, attractive um, and effective uh, firescape landscape. The Firescape Garden is open every day from 8 a.m. to sunset. I highly encourage you to check out the garden. It's a perfect place for an afternoon walk and you'll learn about drought tolerant plants that can help protect your home from a fire. We'll be right back. You know the other day, I was chilling at my house when I got my water bill. It was such a rout. Got me thinking, sip some water, how much time could it take? If you don't do it for the planet, do it for your wallet's sake. So I headed to the bathroom to not make these steak. Because now I'm saving seven whole gallons a week. And while I'm at it, might as well a local shower head pool. I'm only using half the water that I used to. I used to boom and not the hose, saving 
Water, our most precious natural resource. tomorrow. Become the solution. Learn how at svwater.org. Welcome back. Next up is the plant rant. We'll learn about a plant that you've probably seen, but you might not know too much about, the yucca. On each episode of Garden Wise, we'll pick one of the 300,000 flowering plant species on Earth and help you get to know it better. Today, you'll get the scoop on yuccas, a dramatic, dangerous, and drought-tolerant plant. There is a long list of yuccas to choose from. Some are strappy and cactus-like, and others are more fleshy and tropical-looking. Yuccas are very trendy. Garden designers love them because their sculptural quality perfectly accents the clean lines of modern architecture. If ever there was an architectural plant, yucca is it. Before yuccas were prized as garden accents, they were prized by indigenous people all over the Western Americas for their medicinal and nutritional properties. Yucca roots can be used to make soap, their fibrous leaves can be used to make clothing, and their fleshy crowns and bulbs can be cooked over an open fire and eaten. In springtime, yuccas light up with clusters of waxy white bell-shaped flowers. So striking are these flowers that the early Spanish settlers of the southwestern United States called them Lampadas de Dios, or Lanterns of God. The sweet blossoms are an important source of food for bees, bats, and moths. Moths and yuccas need each other to survive. At night, moths pollinate the yucca's fragrant white blossoms and lay their eggs. When the eggs hatch, they feed on the yucca and the cycle begins again. If there was an award for the most dangerous plant, it might well go to the yucca. Almost all yucca leaves are tipped with incredibly sharp spikes. It's the porcupine of plants. <laughs> Be careful where you plant it. Don't plant it next to the swing set, okay? So, yuccas are dramatic, dangerous, and drought tolerant. They look great as a focal point in the garden, planted against a blank wall, or framing a view. Plant them in a well-drained spot and don't overwater. They will reward you with their spiny, sculptural elegance. Is the yucca that perfect plant you've been looking for? If so, get over to a local nursery and start planting. Well, that does it for this episode. There are tons of resources online to help you live green and save water. Visit www.waterwisesb.org for tips or to view past episodes of GardenWise. And if you have any questions or comments, you can always give us a call at 564-5311. I'm Meg West and keep it green, Santa Barbara.